My name is Oscar Moreno, and I am a registered nurse in the El Paso community. I'd like to thank you all for allowing me the opportunity to speak to you today about some of the more common genital urinary disorders faced by our elderly male population. Considering the statistics today, I will be speaking to you all about some of the most common genital urinary disorders, which are erectile dysfunction and benign prostatic hyperplasia. So let's begin by looking at what we need to know. Today we will become aware of what these disorders are, what happens in these disorders, what causes these disorders, the signs and symptoms of these disorders, the treatments for each disorder, how to monitor the effectiveness of these treatments and the progression of the disease, and finally talk about some of the more important facts to know of each disease in order to keep track and prevent serious complications. To begin, let's start off by talking about erectile dysfunction. Erectile dysfunction is one of those topics that many men might not want to openly talk about, but it is a concern that is out there and should be voiced. Erectile dysfunction is a consistent inability to attain or maintain a penile erection for sexual performance. If has been found that half of men aged between 40 and 70 years of age will be affected by this disorder. You see, in the normal male, we have arteries and veins which direct blood flow to and away from the penis, accurately referred to as the dorsal veins and the carvenoso arteries. In addition, we have nerves which regulate blood flow in and out of the penis tissue. This penis tissue is more properly referred to as the corpora carvenosa. The corpora carvenosa is the tissue that holds the blood in the penis much like a sponge, and allows for a male to keep a penile erection. The corpus carvenosum, think of it as a balloon. As you blow air in it, it grows, and as you let air out, the balloon becomes flaccid. The corpus carvenosum works the same way. The human neurovascular system stimulates blood flow to the corpus carvenosum through the release of neurotransmitters and hormones making it grow. Blood is able to stay in the corpus carvenosum, keeping the penis erect through the ongoing blood flow, the relaxation of muscles of the corpus carvenosum blood vessels, and the increase in venous resistance of blood flow, preventing blood from moving away from the penis. So now that we understand the normal function of a penis erection, we must ask ourselves, what happens and causes erectile dysfunction? Well, the reality is that male sexual dysfunction arises due to various reasons. Hormonal changes caused by diseases, psychological problems such as anxiety, depression, and stress can result in reducing neurotransmitter and hormonal production, which is what stimulates penile erection. In addition, the loss of the ability to produce an erection could be caused by physical barriers in the vascular system or even the nervous system of the penis. Cardiovascular disease, neurovascular disease, and medications have been found to produce physical barriers. If blood can get to the corpus carvenosum, an erection cannot ensue. There are specific types of diseases that are unique to erectile dysfunction. Peyronie disease is a disease in which excessive tissue grows along the tissue around the corpus carbonosum balloon, thus altering the expansion of the penis. This excessive tissue is not flexible, thus can alter the shape of the penis and cause deformity and painful curvature which can result in erectile dysfunction. Priapism is another disease unique to erectile dysfunction, which is an erection lasting longer than four hours and is a medical emergency. What happens is that blood stays too long in the corpus carvenosum and becomes deoxygenated, causing damage to the tissue cells and killing them. In severe cases, gangrene can develop, causing the need for amputation of the penis. Lastly, an ejaculation is unique to erectile dysfunction, which is a loss of the ejaculation of semen. This condition can be a result from hormonal deficiencies, in particular testosterone, which is commonly referred to as a male sex hormone. 
Also, it, this disease can be ensued due to medications, surgeries, and other diseases. Two subgroups to this condition are retrograde ejaculation, in which the semen does not expel out of the body, and premature ejaculation, in which ejaculation is persistent and happens with minimal stimulation. Now I would like to take the time to talk about the signs and symptoms of erectile dysfunction. The obvious principal sign and symptom is the inability to produce an erection of the penis. Pain could be a sign and symptom of erectile dysfunction, depending on what is causing the erectile dysfunction. Penile deformity could also be a sign and symptom, depending on the cause. Anxiety and depression may be a sign as well that something is just not right when it comes to sexual performance. These are but a few signs and symptoms unique to erectile dysfunction. It is important to note that most signs and symptoms are reflective of the disease that is actually causing the erectile dysfunction to develop. So prompt intervention to those diseases should be initiated. So let's look at how exactly erectile dysfunction is diagnosed and what tests are used to identify these causes. An extensive evaluation of the patient's medical history should be taken to assess possible causes. Depression, hypertension, diabetes, neuropathy, high cholesterol, and other cardiovascular diseases could be used to diagnose and identify the cause. Surgical history could be used to diagnose the cause. In addition, a psychological evaluation may identify possible mental barriers to the production of penile erection. Lab work can be done to assess the hormone levels, in particular testosterone and prolactin, which can identify and distinguish hormonal causes. There is also more objective tests that can be completed to identify the cause. The nocturnal penile tuminescence test is one in which erection is assessed during the night and morning to see if erection does develop. If erection is developing during sleep, it can be concluded that the cause of erectile dysfunction is not a physical one, but a psychological one. Ultrasound and x-ray imaging can be also used to identify possible physical barriers in the vascularity of the penis, which is inhibiting circulation to and or away from the penis. So you may be asking yourself, what can we do to help treat this disease if you are diagnosed? Treatment is based on cause. So some of the common treatments include counseling and behavioral therapy, lifestyle changes to address the core morbidities, such as diet and exercise changes, hormone replacement therapy of testosterone, medications to help stimulate blood flow to the penis, and there's also other mechanical interventions. A penis pump, as shown in this picture, is a device which uses pressure to vacuum blood to the penis. A penis ring, which is placed at the base of the penis, is applied to prevent blood flow away from the penis. Such device has been shown to be effective in most cases and with rare serious complications. But compliance is to this is low due to the discomfort of using such a device. Lastly, surgical interventions are available which are invasive and have, have high risk for infection and damage to surrounding tissues and organs. The use of an implanted prosthetic that uses a pump to inflate and disinflate and vascular reconstruction to promote blood to this penis is a common surgical procedure. So how do we evaluate if the treatment is working? We assess. Firstly, we need to ensure that underlying cause is under control. So keeping control of such core morbidities such as diabetes, hypertension, depression, and high cholesterol, and keeping compliance with lifestyle changes should be ensured. Monitoring of hormone replacement therapy and hormone levels through lab work is also important. For those that, are re that received a surgical intervention, monitoring for infection and mechanical mishaps should be monitored to ensure that relief from treatment continues. If a person with erectile dysfunction is able to acquire and maintain a penile erection, it means that the treatment is working. Patient satisfaction is our goal in the treatment of this disease. As patients, it's important to keep in mind that if an erection lasts more than four hours, it is a medical emergency and quick intervention is needed. In addition, 
For those patients with underlying cardiovascular disease, taking medications to treat erectile dysfunction should be used with caution and only under the supervision of a healthcare provider. Now let's change directions here and start talking about the other common genital urinary disease known as benign prostatic hyperplasia, also referred to as BPH. BPH is the most common non-cancerous tumor in men. BPH is the enlargement of the prostate gland which causes obstruction of the urethra. The urethra is a tube that allows excursion of urine from the bladder to outside the human body. Studies have shown that BPH is most common in men 41 years of age and older and the incidence of the disease increases with age. So the older you are, the more likely that you have BPH. Now let's look at what a normal prostate looks like and does. A normal prostate gland is about the size of a walnut and lies between the penis and the bladder in which the urethral canal runs through. As you can see through this picture, the urethral runs through the prostate and is one of the main reasons why BPH symptoms arise. We will discuss this further in this video. The function of the prostate gland is to secrete fluids that nourish and protect sperm during ejaculation and to squeeze fluid into the urethra. So what happens with BPH, you ask? Well, the straightforward answer is that the prostate just gets bigger. It has been found that in BPH, what happens is that the prostate begins to have cellular overaccumulation, which causes the prostate to get big. The cause is not completely understood, but it has been suggested that the disease has multiple factors and is under hormonal control. The common factors that have been found are age and increased production of dihydrotestosterone, which prevents cellular death of the prostate cells. The decreased levels of testosterone in elderly males has been thought to be the biggest influential factor. As you can see in this picture, the prostate gets so large that it shrinks and occludes the urethral canal and prevents the flow of urine from the bladder down the urethral canal. This is why a lot of the symptoms that present with BPH do present. So considering the narrowing of the urethral canal, it is harder for urine to flow out of the body. So common symptoms include urinary hesitancy, decreased urinary stream, feeling of an incomplete bladder, post-void dribbling, urgency, frequency, and constant urination at night. Physical examination through a rectal exam will also demonstrate a large and rubbery feel to the prostate gland. It is important to note that if bleeding does present with these symptoms, further evaluation for cancer and or infection should be initiated until ruled otherwise. So diagnosis of BPH is based on various manifestations. First, the signs and symptoms should be assessed to see if they are reflective of BPH. Other urethral complications can mimic the symptoms of BPH and should be ruled out before diagnosing such disease. The digital rectal examination is the most appropriate and common exam for assessing the presence of BPH. As seen in the picture, a lubricated glove finger is placed through the rectum in order to feel the size and the texture of the prostate gland. Usually the gland will feel enlarged and rubbery in BPH. If the prostate gland feels hardened, examination for malignancy should be followed. PSA levels, will uh, which are collected through blood work, have been found to identify enlargement of the prostate, but are no indication for the true diagnosis of BPH. Other exams include urine analysis, blood work, ultrasound, and cystoscopy, which is a procedure which is a tube is inserted through the urethra to visually inspect the prostate. These other exams are only used for serious symptomology and to rule out other possible diagnosis. Treatment for BPH is symptom-based and go from the least invasive to the most invasive. For mild symptoms, typically no intervention is needed, but waiting out to see if symptoms improve on their own. It has been found that some men's symptoms improve on their own, 
For moderate symptoms, usually medication and or invasive uh, therapy are considered. Typical medications for the treatment of BPH include alpha blockers, which help prevent muscle tightening of the bladder and prostate, thus facilitate, facilitating urine flow. Another drug co uh, commonly used is a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, which works by inhibiting the conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone. If you recall, dihydrotestosterone is a hormone which inhibits the death of prostate cells. So by stopping the conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone, the size of the gland can reduce. Surgical interventions is usually reserved for severe symptoms, which include BPH resistance to treatment, recurrent urinary tract infections, bladder stones, and kidney disease. A transurethral resection of the prostate, most commonly referred to as a TERP, is the most common surgical procedure used to treat BPH. As depicted in the picture, an instrument is inserted through the urethral opening down to the prostate in which the section of the prostate which is blocking urine flow is removed. This procedure is done under anesthesia. There is also a prostatectomy, which is a complete removal of the prostate and is commonly used for severely enlarged prostates. There is other surgical procedures as mentioned on this, on this slide that are least invasive, but all are initiated through the insertion of a device down the urethra. Clinical outcomes differ based on the intervention and choices are made based on the patient's needs. Monitoring of the effectiveness of treatment is based on the improvement of symptoms. If symptoms worsen, further need for intervention or adjustment to current medication regimens may be due. If progressive urinary retention presents with no resolution through interventions, surgical intervention may be indicated. Monitoring of recurrent urinary tract infections and visible bleeding could indicate need for further evaluation due to possible progression or other possible complications. Right before we wrap up here, I'd like to talk about two other common prostate disorders which can mimic symptoms of BPH and undergo alternate treatments. Prostitis is inflammation of the prostate which is caused by either bacteria or trauma. This disease is usually resolved through the treatment uh, with antibiotics and or anti-inflammatory drugs. The other prostate disorder and the most critical is prostate cancer. As can be seen in the fact sheet on this slide, one out of seven men are expected to be diagnosed with prostate cancer and incidents arise with age. Close monitoring for blood in the urine should be ensured and if present, immediate intervention should be followed. The prognosis of prostate cancer is good if treated in a timely manner with either hormone therapy, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and at times surgical intervention. Treatment is based on progression and severity of the disease. Well, we went through a lot of information today and I know it's a lot to grasp, but it is all vital information to improve your health. Remember to always follow up with your primary care physician and report any abnormalities even if they seem a little personal. Healthcare providers have seen it all and heard it all and nothing shocks us. We keep your information confidential and ultimately are here to help you feel great. I thank you for your time and please feel free to ask me any questions or concerns you may have. Hope you all have a great day and let's live it up!